This will be our last lesson on Chapter 8, Lipids and Membranes, in which we'll be looking at anchored proteins and the fluid mosaic model. Recall from our last lesson we saw that one type of membrane protein is a lipid-linked protein. It's otherwise soluble except that it has this lipid anchor, and that anchors it in one side of the bilayer or the other. Some may also have a transmembrane region, but this is not altogether common. Now keep in mind, because that anchor only in integrates within one half of that bilayer, it might be anchored inside or outside of the cell or compartment. In the case of those proteins that carry carbohydrate groups as a part of that anchor, because they're large, bulky groups and highly hydrated, they tend to have that anchor on the outside of the cell. Here are two examples of lipid-linked proteins. In the figure on the left, part A, the blue portion represents uh, an amino acid side chain or portion of a protein, and to this we have attached a lipid anchor. In this case, it's simply a fatty acid chain, and so we have an amide link to our protein. In the one on the right, we have a more complicated lipid anchor. In this case, we have a series of carbohydrate residues indicated by the cyclic structures here. We still have our protein component in blue. To this is attached these carbohydrate residues, and to that is attached our lipid. The anchors are pictured in green. So in the figure on the left, our lipid anchor is simply a fatty acid chain, one tail. In the figure on the right, our lipid anchor is actually a phospholipid with a carbohydrate head group, a more complex structure. And in each case, the blue portion is the part where it's connected to the protein. So you can see that the anchors can vary quite a bit in terms of complexity, and this also has to do with how they associate with the membrane and whether they are associated inside or outside of that membrane. The fluid mosaic model was originally described by Singer and Nicholson in 1972. The original idea was that the membrane proteins could float entirely randomly in this sea of lipids. What we find, however, is that, that is, though that is mostly true, they're not entirely free to move. There are some restrictions to their movement, and that may be because they're interacting with other proteins, or more specifically with cytoskeletal proteins. That's what we have illustrated here. In the case of protein A, it's actually attached to the cytoskeleton, and so it's entirely immobile. It's fixed in its position. Protein B, however, it is encased within the series of cytoskeletal proteins, but it's mobile within that small area. We might think of another example of a protein C that would be entirely mobile, not connected in any way, and that's not part of our illustration here. The point to remember is that these proteins interact with other proteins and components within the cell because they have a specific function. So if protein A requires for its function that it be attached to the cytoskeleton, that's why it's localized to that area. If B functions within that outlined area, but it needs to be mobile within that area, that's why it's structured and connected in that way. So we find that proteins, as well as lipids, may be asymmetrical in the membrane. This concludes our studies in Chapter 8. We'll begin our considerations of membrane transport in Chapter 9 in our next video lesson. We want to examine how these lipid bilayers we considered in this chapter allow us to vary the concentration of ions both inside and outside the cell. We also want to see how these ion gradients allow us to establish a membrane potential.